Hello everyone, Panzer J back with a new video. This video um, deals with historical board gaming's Global War 1939. And this particular video is going to be on the United States. So we're going to talk about some uh, possible strategies and tactics you can use as the United States. Um, the board, you see it looks pretty empty. We've just got the United States set up um, on the board and that's it. So this is their initial um, unit placement. It just makes things a little bit easier um, as far as uh, seeing the map, not having all the other countries' units cluttered in there. So we've just got the United States set up. And we're going to talk about um, the units the United States starts the game with, uh, their income, and again, some of maybe the strategies and goals um, you're looking to accomplish and employ during the game to make the United States as successful as possible. I've played the United States several times, and um, including the last uh, game that we played, and the Allies came out on top, and the United States was probably about the strongest uh, of the Allied uh, partners at the end of that game. So probably talk a little bit about things I specifically did last turn, although none of these um, strategies are set in stone and I'm hardly an expert on um, what you need to do as the United States. This is just going to be some things that I prefer, some of my own personal uh, preferences. So to start the game, the United States is neutral. So they're not at war with anybody um, at the beginning of the game. Now, obviously, if a nation were to attack them, Germany, Japan, Italy, then they're automatically uh, in the war. But barring a Axis attack directly on the United States, in order for the United States to enter the war, they have to reach their wartime income of $80. And that $80 is derived from um, all the territories the United States owns at the beginning of the game, total $80. So they have to reach that $80 before they can enter the conflict on their own. And how they enter or how they determine their or reach their wartime income is the same way in which the Soviet Union does. They roll at the end of each of their turns, they roll two 12-sided die and add that up um, each turn until they get to $80. So... It's totally uh, random which turn the United States is able to enter the conflict. Again, this is barring um, them being directly attacked and they're automatically in the conflict. And whatever their um, the current die rolls are, they automatically go to the $80 once they're attacked. But barring that, they roll till they get to 80 and the die rolls are cumulative each round. So you add them up. Um so depending on how you roll, you could roll really bad and it could take the United States, you know, six turns or more before they're in the game. Or depending, obviously, if you roll fairly decently, they're going to be in position to get into the conflict uh, much earlier than the Axis opponent is going to want them in the game. And as far as the money they spend each turn, that is also determined by the die roll. So on turn one, they have $20 in the bank, so to speak, to spend. OK, um, so they'll spend twenty dollars on turn one, but then subsequently every turn after that, the money they're able to spend is what the die roll is. So let's say, for instance, on turn one, they spend their twenty dollars they have or they can save it. You don't have to spend the money. And at the end of their turn one, they roll the two 12 sided die and roll a total of 18. Th they'll collect that eighteen dollars for turn two. So then on turn two, they'll have the $18 to spend worth of their die rolls, as well as um, any money they had saved from the 20 they started the game with. Then at the end of their turn two, they roll a two 12-sided die again, and let's say they roll eight, 11 total. Add that to the 18 they rolled the first turn, and now you're at $29 the United States would collect. So And then it goes like that for each uh, subsequent turn continuing to roll the two 12-sided die, collecting that amount of money each turn, and then going ahead and trying to reach the $80 threshold. 
so that they can enter the war themselves. Now, usually um, the United States will have been attacked before they reach their $80, um, but that's the goal to reach the $80. And there are things that would boost um, the United States' uh, income during uh, while they're rolling. And some of those things are below here. There are certain events that get triggered that would increase the U.S. Uh, income. Um, Germany and Italy attacks France. That's plus five for the United States. Germany and Italy attacks Great Britain, which would be London, Liverpool, or Scotland. That's plus 20. Germany, Italy, or Japan attacks Russia, plus 10. Germany, Italy attacks any territory in South America or enters Argentina, plus 30. An unprovoked declaration of war by Japan on the UK Commonwealth, plus 25. And then Japan attacks Australia and or New Zealand mainland, plus 2. So in addition to your two 12-sided die you're rolling each turn, um, any of those actions that I just listed would add that amount to um, the U.S.'s die roll. So for instance, again, let's say that we the U.S. rolled 18 and then 11, on turns one and two, that's 29. But within those first two turns, uh, Germany has attacked France, so that's plus five. So now that's 34 the U.S. is at. And then let's also just say uh, Japan has uh, launched an unpro unprovoked declaration of war on the U.K. and the Pacific. That's another 25. So that would be up to $59. So there are several events that will trigger an increase to the U.S. income. And the Axis player is usually uh, pretty smart about um, trying to avoid getting the U.S. into the war um, sooner rather than later. So some of those things the Axis player will avoid. Some of them he can't. Like the attack on France is a given right on turn one. So that's going to be plus five to the United States. But so that's how the U.S. income works and how they can possibly enter the war. Again, if they're attacked, then all bets are off and the U.S. income is set at $80 and they're automatically in the conflict. So, so let's talk about what the U.S. starts the game with. Now, they don't start the game with a lot. We're looking at the uh, east coast of the United States here. Um, and this represents the fact that the U.S. was very much um, an isolationist country um, at the start of World War II. Um, there was uh, a lot of sentiment to not enter the conflict. Um, so the U.S. military wasn't exactly um, in full gear when war started in 1939. So over here on the east coast of the United States, we start out with, in Washington, you've got an infantry, a Marine, uh, a tactical bomber, a fighter. Uh, you've got two destroyers and a sub. In New England, we've got another major conflict in an infantry, and then we've got an infantry in the Great Plains. So that's all the United States starts out with um, on the European side of the map. So not a lot of options. If we take a look over in the Pacific, um, it's very similar. They definitely have more of a naval presence, but again, not a whole lot of units. We've got a destroyer and a marine with a fortification in the Philippines. And then over here in Hawaii, you've got a decent navy, a decent fleet built up, a couple of destroyers, a transport, a cruiser, a battleship, a carrier with a fighter and a tactical. And then off the west coast of the United States, we've got a sub, a transport, a destroyer, a cruiser, and a battleship. In San Francisco, you've got a major complex and an infantry. And then in western United States, you've got an infantry and a artillery. And that's all the United States has as far as units on the board to start the game. So honestly, of the major powers, um, they actually have even less units, military units on the board than Italy. So as far as just pure military power, the United States starts out uh, fairly weak. Another thing about the United States, a kind of a restriction they have, prior to entering the conflict, they cannot move any of their units um, off of U.S. territories or uh, naval units have to be um, in the same zone as a U.S. territory or a U.S. convoy box. 
So like, for instance, in the Atlantic, you've got two U.S. convoy boxes here, one in mid-Atlantic, one in uh, the northern Atlantic. So, for instance, I wouldn't, as the United States, be able to like move these two destroyers in this sub over here off the coast of France um, while the United States is neutral. That's not allowed. They basically have to stay over here um, in U.S. territory. So you can't um, like position your U.S. units um, prior to entering the war. You can't position them to then be able to immediately enter the war when the United States um, does enter the conflict. So you've got to kind of stay back and, and uh, be in U.S. territory or U.S. Um, sea zones. Um, so that kind of hampers you a little bit. You can't even like kind of get a jump start. You got to, you know, stay where you're at, stay at home, so to speak. Um, also, as far as any kind of um, special rules governing the United States, we've got um, the United States um, is the victim of a Japanese sneak attack. So what that means is that um, it's called the caught off guard. If Japan attacks the U.S. using their sneak attack, the U.S. may not defend on the first round of combat and all ships suffer a minus two for defense for the rest of the battle. All other units defend as normal starting in the second round of combat. So if Japan, which has allowed three sneak attacks um, in the game, if they use one of their sneak attacks on the United States, um, and especially if it was um, naval units they're targeting, which I guess would kind of simulate um, the Pearl Harbor attack, then the U.S. units are all minus two on their die roll for the first turn, except for the naval units, which stay at minus two uh, for the battle. So you definitely, as the United States, do not want to be anywhere near, um, especially Japanese naval units, and have your naval units um, in danger of being attacked by the Japanese. So they, especially if you've concentrated a, a large fleet in one sea zone, then the Japanese are going to pick that as their um, sneak attack and they're going to just destroy your fleet. So let's say, for instance, if we're a couple of turns in the game and this U.S. fleet is sitting here in Hawaii still and the Japanese were, say, a couple of sea zones away and they launched their attack into Pearl Harbor here and they say, hey, this is going to be my sneak attack. Now all of these U.S. ships, the battleship, the cruiser, the two destroyers, the carrier, all that are minus two. Um, for the entire uh, battle, the uh, two planes would be minus two just for the first round of combat. But you can see how that would like literally decimate the U.S. fleet. So one thing you want to do as the U.S., again, you can't um, position your units anywhere near um, another country's land or sea zones. But you can move, for instance, you're going to move this U.S. fleet back from Hawaii. You're not going to leave that sitting there. You can pull it back to the west coast of the United States. I like to start bringing some units, um, these naval units, over from the Pacific, make their way maybe through the Panama Canal, and start coming back over here to the east coast of the United States. And that's because my overall strategy is going to be Germany first. Now, that was also something that the Allies did in the war was a Germany first approach. And that's also what I'm looking to do uh, in this game as well. And that is what I did um, each of the times I've played as the United States. So I want to put as much pressure on Germany as I can. So I'm going to be positioning as many of my units on the East Coast here so that when the United States does enter the war, they can immediately um, apply pressure to Germany in France, for instance. So I'm going to transfer the majority of my Pacific fleet from uh, the Pacific over here into the Atlantic off the east coast of the United States. Also, whatever buys that I spend each turn, uh, if not all, I would say around 90% of my buys are going to be placed here on the East Coast. 
So I'm going to be looking at buying transports. Transports are extremely important. Obviously, that's what's going to get your infantry and your tanks and your artillery over to uh, France itself. So I'm going to be buying transports. I'm also going to be buying men and artillery to pair with the men. And all of this is going to be positioned here in New England. Okay, and there is a major complex and a naval base, so you can put both ground and naval units down. So that when the United States, let's say it's around turn five, and now the United States is in the conflict, they've been attacked or they're at their $80. So now, because I'm at a naval base, I can go three spaces instead of the normal two. So now on the very first turn, the United States is in the conflict, they can go one, two, three and land either in Normandy or Bordeaux. So the turn the United States is in the conflict, they can immediately land in France. And if you're on average, again, let's say it's around turn five, maybe probably turn six at the latest that United, the United States is in the conflict, that's, you know, uh, all those turns worth of spending money. Now, you're not maybe spending a lot of money, especially depending on what your die roll is. But nonetheless, if you've devoted, you know, pretty much all of your build to each of those turns to uh, the East Coast here, you're going to have a significant force built up. I think the last game, for instance, um, when the United States entered the conflict, and I'm not sure exactly what turn that was, but it was around turn five. Um, I had, I think, eight transports, eight infantry, uh, eight artillery, um, a couple of destroyers, a couple of cruisers, and two carriers with a fighter and a tactical bomber each. So that was a significant force right away. And again, I was able to land in France on my very, on the very turn the United States entered the war. And that's significant because by the time the United States enters the conflict, Germany almost definitely has invaded Russia. So as the United States, you want to take pressure away, um, from the Russians. You've, you've got to open up that second front to divert German resources, uh, German um, economic power and military power away from the Russian front. Because if you don't apply that um, second front and don't apply pressure on Germany, they're just going to steamroll right through Russia. Um, so you, you want to be in a position as soon as the United States enters the conflict to land in France. And if you're working, which I'm assuming you will be with your um, United Kingdom partner, then they probably will be in a position, since you've coordinated, to land in France ahead of you that turn. Um, Germany goes first each turn. The UK, I believe, is fourth, and the United States is like sixth or seventh. So before Germany would get their next turn, the UK could land in one of these territories, Normandy or Bordeaux, and then a couple of uh, player, a couple of player turns later, the United States lands on the same round of play. So now before Germany can counterattack on the on the next turn, both the UK and the United States have landed in France, and the two of them combined, the two forces combined, should be enough to repel um, a possible German counterattack. And now you've opened up that second front. So the overall strategy for the United States, in my opinion, has got to be taking out Germany first, Okay. Um, not that Japan isn't a threat, but we'll talk about Japan in the Pacific in a minute. But it's got to be Germany first. And what you're going to do is transfer, if not all, the majority of the fleet in the Pacific over here into the Atlantic. And then all of, either all or most of your buys up until the turn you enter the conflict is all going to be spent here in the east uh, coast of the United States in Washington and New England, building up. Um, a, a bunch of transports, a bunch of men and artillery, maybe tanks, so that on the turn the United States enters the conflict, bam, they're immediately in Bordeaux or Normandy. So that's kind of like the overall strategy is the United States, Germany first, Germany first, Germany first. Now in the Pacific, you also will have your hands full with the Japanese. But depending on how aggressive the Japanese player has been, you hopefully have a bunch of allies um, in the Pacific still um, putting up a good fight before you. Uh, by the time you enter the war. So you've got the Far East Command down here. 
You've got national China is the green. Communist China is kind of the maroonish color. Um, you have Anzac down here in Australia. So Japan should hopefully have their handfuls. Not that any of those um, countries are that strong, but hopefully that J Japan hasn't eliminated any one of them completely, and they're all at least um, being nuisances to the Japanese. I mean, the Japanese, you know, they want to go for all these money islands. That takes a lot of transports and men. Um, also, the Russians hopefully have amassed a force along the border here in Manchuria. So Japan hopefully still has their hands full dealing with all these various allied power, uh, countries. So you don't need to be in a position necessarily when the United States enters the conflict to have this huge fleet ready to roll in Japan. Um, honestly, on the last game, I didn't even build a fleet to go to Japan until like around turn six or seven. I had been in the conflict for a couple of turns. Um, and again, all the turns prior to entering the war, I had spent on um, units on the European side of the map. I had spent almost nothing over here in the Pacific. I had left a skeleton fleet off of San Francisco. And then around turn six is when I started putting money in the Pacific. Um, at that point, the Japanese Navy was kind of spread out down here in the South Pacific. Um, and now I could start building up my own fleet without the danger of Japan, you know, sinking it using their sneak attack and whatnot. So I didn't start putting money in the Pacific until um, several turns after I had entered the conflict. And I think that's a good strategy with the United States. Um, again, I think Germany is the... Uh, the greater threat. Whereas Japan, even if they are collecting a bunch of money and have kind of went wild here in the South Pacific, maybe they're even pushing China to the brink of extinction. Um, they're down here into the Far East Command territories. Even still, um, none of those allied powers, they're not the big three. The big three are the United States, Russia, and the United Kingdom. So Japan isn't in a position to take out any of the big three, whereas Germany can take out Russia if you're not careful, and maybe even the UK. So it's definitely uh, prudent to follow the Germany first strategy. So again, I'm not going to spend a bunch of money in the Pacific. As a matter of fact, I wouldn't spend almost anything at all until you've entered the conflict. And even then it might take you a turn or two beyond that before you really start putting money into the Pacific. So, uh, that's how things look um, on the Pacific side of the map. Um, you don't really have to worry about a Japanese attack on the United States. Now, in a couple of the games that we've played, Japan has landed on the West Coast, uh, but they didn't take San Francisco, and they really got crushed the one time they tried to take San Francisco. It's extremely difficult for Japan to um, invade you know, or successfully invade the United States and take out I mean, San Francisco. Um, it just, it's almost definitely not going to happen. It hasn't happened in any of the games we've played or really any of the games I've um, seen. So you don't have any realistic danger that Japan is going to threaten uh, San Francisco. So you really don't have a lot to worry about on this side. And again, I think United States resources are better spent um, over here. Um, on the European side of the map, trying to take out Germany and Italy for that matter as well. Um, you can build up a U.S. fleet, not only to land in France, but that you can also come down here, make your way into the mouth of the Mediterranean. Because um, more likely than not, the Italians have kicked the British fleet out of the Mediterranean and kind of have the Med all to themselves and are collecting that $5 bonus for no allied ships in the Mediterranean. So you would like to get back into the Med, not only to take that bonus, but then maybe start threatening the Italian mainland itself. So you can also uh, be building maybe a second U.S. fleet, um, depending on how your die rolls have went and what kind of income you've got prior to entering the war. You can maybe build a second fleet down here um, by... Um, the southern portion of Washington by this major conflict or major uh, factory and coming to anticipation of coming down into the Mediterranean. 
So you can also do that. Um, as far as any special units, the United States is um, has Marines, which they are plus one on amphibious assaults. So if you plan on doing any amphibious assaults, which is the United States, you have to, because obviously you're not connected by land to any of your opponents. So um, at least initially, whether it's landing over here in France, you know, maybe in North Africa and Italy, over in the Pacific, doing island hopping, whatever, everything is going to be initial amphibious assault. So um, putting money into Marines um, so they don't suffer that minus one on the first round of combat for amphibious assaults. And a matter of fact, they're plus one. Um, that would be a, a good move. Also, starting on turn 10, if the game reaches that long, um, the United States battleships um, all attack and defend at one um, plus one, so they go up to nine on the die roll, and that um, signifies that the United States has got the Iowa-class battleship uh, now in the war. Also, another um, thing the United States can do to help out the Allies prior to entering the conflict is lend-lease. So the United States is able to lend-lease any um, Allied power that is at war, excluding China. And they can attempt to lend lease half of their income. So uh, prior to, for instance, prior to the Russians being in the conflict, they're not going to be able to send any money to Russia. It's only after Russia is actually in the war. But UK, uh, France, which are not, they're not going <laughs> to uh, still be around to lend money to. But um, the United Kingdom, the Far East Command, ANZAC, the United States can attempt to lend lease money to them. So basically how it works is, let's say on turn two, the U.S. income is at $25. So uh, they can attempt to lend half of that to um, one of their uh, one of the allied powers that's currently at war. So $12 they would be able to attempt to send. And... With the money, that could a couple of different things could happen with that. Um, it's all on a die roll, so you roll one 12 sided die. A roll of one, all the production certificates are captured by the Axis. Two through four, the certificates are lost and returned to the bank. Five through seven, half of the certificates are lost and returned to the bank. And eight through 12, all of the money is transferred successfully. So if you're trying to send $12, you roll an 8 through 12, the UK, if that's where you want it to go, gets the whole 12 bucks. On a roll of 1, the Axis capture it, and they get the 12 bucks. Uh, 2 through 4, uh, half of the, so that'd be 6 bucks, is lost to the bank. The other half um, goes to the Allies. So depending on the die roll, you could uh, really help out one of your... Uh, future allies, or you can actually even bump up some Axis money. And in the in the last couple of games, um, the last game uh, that I played as the United States, a uh, couple of turns, I had sent money to the UK, I believe three turns, two of them, all the money got there, and then the other turn, half of it did. And then the game before that, I was actually the Axis uh, powers, and the U U.S. player attempted to send the money, and all of it got captured by me. He rolled a one, and then he stopped trying to uh, to send money after that. So I think he got a little gun shy about um, <laughs> sending any more money the uh, uh, to his allies. So that's another um, important thing the United States can do. Obviously, they don't have a ton of money at the start of the game for the first few turns, but they're also not at war. So them trying to lend lease and send half of their money to the UK, who at that point is at least at war with Germany and Italy, maybe even Japan, definitely could go a long way to, to keeping them in the fight so that when you eventually get in yourself, you still have um, some viable allies to fight alongside you. So that's about it for the United States. Again, just like with Russia, they're neutral to start the game. So you really have to kind of wait and see um, how the Axis play the game. Um, you know, you might have a strategy in mind, you know, that you're going to go Germany first, go hard after Germany, spend all your money, 
you know, on the European side of the map. But then let's say that surprisingly the UK is kicking the crap out of Germany, got kind of got them held down and Japan is running wild. So then you would be spending your money more in the Pacific. So um, the Germany first is a, you know, the overall strategy I think you should go with, but obviously it's also going to depend on how things are going in the game. Cause as the allies, you're very much reactionary to what the Axis does, especially Germany or especially uh, the United States and Russia, because they're not even in the conflict to start uh, the game. So hopefully you enjoyed the video. Um, we'll be back with another allied strategy video. I think we're going to, uh, China is going to be up next. So we'll talk about them and uh, we'll see you next time.